I, I, I feel blessed to have you. Oh, no. My pleasure. What I know. Her. I know you well, right? Uh, yeah. A lot of people may not know you, and I know you well from as a friend, observing you as a, as a, as a, as a trendsetter. What you did in Brian's career has been like mind boggling. And, and then you had involvement with Earth, Wind, and Fire. You're, you're trailblazing. And, oh, and Dave Pinsada. How can I forget Dave Pinsada? You're a trendsetter, man. You're, a, you're doing what millennials do. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny you say that because um, well, two quick ones. One is I find myself on so many people ask for advice and on boards and all these kinds of things. And that's nothing I ever set out to do. But you're, you're honored that people care enough to want to know what you think. And you realize that you can have influence on things, sometimes small, sometimes great. And I was looking at my bio, somebody wanted my bio for some deck, and I was looking at it and I was like, damn, this is either a really old person or he's busy as hell, right? And the range of stuff was so amazing and it made me reflect back on, on a couple of points. My, my time with Maurice White was such an interesting game changer. And one of the things that he had said to me, he said, I've never had a black representative. But let me hold up. You, you, just, you just hit a nerve. Maurice White of Earth, Wind & Fire. Right. First tell me, when did you get involved with him? And, and I'll let you come back and make your statement. Okay. When, when did you get involved with Earth, Wind & Fire? So, to, so in any career, this is important for your audience, you're going to go up and down. I, get, I speak to lots of people. Lots of colleges, Google, all kinds of stuff. And I tell people it's like surfing. Your job is just to stay up on the board. It's not to be pretty. Sometimes you're going to hit a wave. Sometimes it's going to be smooth. But you're just trying to stay up, right? We want to be pretty every now and then, though. Come on. Well, no, no. Oh, no. We, we, we got to have swag. No, we got people talking. Don't, don't get that twisted. Well, I'll get to that in a second. So I was in a down period of my career. Brian and I had come to the end of our relationship. Um, and ultimately the way it ended, which it often does, was one of those things that not only was unbalanced, it just was unnecessarily funky, but every, everybody had their position. A friend of mine said, hey man, I worked with Maurice White. He's looking for some input and stuff. He put a lunch together. We had lunch. I sat at that lunch talking to myself with my internal voice going, you're sitting with Maurice White. Don't act like you're nervous. Hold on, do this and the other. And then, this is how long ago it was, probably it was early 2000s, he said, fax me some ideas. Mm. So I faxed him some ideas, and he said, man, why don't you come to the house? I was like, oh, shit, I'm going to Reese White's house. Yeah, tell me about it. And I went, to, I went to his house, and in his living room, he had a pool table with a bunch of travel cases on it. And so I'm looking at those travel cases, and they were small. And, you know, I had... For many, many a year as a manager, and I was like, the only thing that could be in those travel cases are kalimbas. It's mm -hmm. too small for anything else. And I said, I, I said, Maurice, are those kalimbas in there? And he said, oh, man, yeah. And so he went and opened one. Wow. And so while he's talking to me, he starts unconsciously playing. Now, all of us who have played with an African thumb piano, you know, we do this, tinka, 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 that, that's, that's what you do with a kalimba, shit. Maurice White was going, oh my God. Doing chords and stuff, and I'm literally saying that, sitting there going, don't faint, don't faint. <laughs> and I went, and I remember when it was over, I went outside his house, and I called every friend in college and said, all those air guitar stuff that we used to do coming up, all those, are, I just left Maurice White's house, held the kalimba that he did evil on, I and watched him play it, and then he explained to me how he did it. So the, the, that story is to just, it's a metaphor for, I've had all these moments in my career that you don't see coming, but you, but you step, my, my, my theory is you step into it when it comes up, and then you figure out what you make what you can do with it. You know, I, I mean, I took his catalog to Broadway. I've never went to Broadway. And it was yeah. an amazing experience. So I've had a number of series along the ways of now that I look back at it and go, wow, this is this is pretty, pretty incredible. So I feel very blessed. But yet, again, I say this is about celebrating you. I'm, I'm ecstatic that we're going to get an opportunity 
to celebrate as as a nation, and I'm going to even say as a planet, mm -hmm. we're going to celebrate African American heritage in a way that it's never been celebrated before. Mm -hmm. This is bigger than the Martin Luther King holiday. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King holiday has its place, and I and I shouldn't say bigger than because in its own way it served its purpose because it's where it's why we're standing here being able to celebrate Juneteenth because of the shoulders of people like Martin Luther King and Jesse Jackson and John Lewis and so many others. Yeah. Uh, I know you, but a lot of people may not know mm -hmm. you, you have been a major, major torch carrier mm -hmm. in our industry in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us first, how did you get into the music business? Uh, because that might, that might set the stage for where we, we need to go with this, but I want people to know to know why we're celebrating you and, and mm -hmm. what you, where did you come from? So I'll try to wrap up a long story in a short way. So I was born in Montreal, Canada to- Canadian. Yeah. To, I love it, continue. <clears throat> so my dad was the Jackie Robinson of, of the Canadian Football League. He broke the color barrier. He and Jackie Robinson were friends. He's a well-time all-star. There's a park named after him. So I was born into this thing. I mean, there was press at the hospital when I was born because my father was that popular. Mm. And so what I experienced growing so, up... Were you born with a silver spoon in your mouth? No. See, that's the interesting, <laughs> about, that's the interesting thing about it. So when you talk about racism, so think about this. My father was the captain of the football team, 12-time um, all-star, hugely popular. Wow. Canada was not very racial, but in the off season, mm. he would have to wrestle or sell shoes or do other things to keep his, to keep his income up. So mm. as big as you were, you were reminded about your blackness. And this was before I was oh, born. Okay. <clears throat> so then once I was born into that, all I knew was for some reason, people treated my dad really nicely. And I was her child junior. So there was press and stuff, but I was too young to know it. My parents divorced. So I moved to Kentucky from Montreal in the middle of the 60s. So all of a sudden, my mom, who would be dancing in the, with the mayor, once I got off the plane in Kentucky, was like, Mother, Mother, why are they calling me nigger, Mother? What does that mean? <laughs> so my formative years went from Canada to, to Kentucky. And Kentucky was Southern and racial and a lot of different musical influences. And it was in the 60s. And all during that process, I was allowed great fortitude with my high school. I went to a high school that had a lot of money <clears throat> and I played football. And the show business thing was born in that my dad used to tell me, don't play football, you're too smart. And I was a kid at the time, I didn't really process that well. And so weirdly enough, I had friends on the basketball team. I ended up managing the high school basketball team and they gave me the program. Amazing. So I had budgets. I ran the pregame warm-ups, I put my team in jumpsuits, I got leather traveling equipment, and consequently, I got seven full scholarship rides from basketball coaches around the state of Kentucky. How to old be a man. At this time? I was in senior in high school. Get out of here. Yeah, so I went to college on a basketball scholarship for being a manager for controlling a program and also bringing sizzle to the program. Now, I didn't realize at the time that was show business stuff, I always looked to how to make things stand out. Fast forward, uh, in high school, I, had a, I mean, in college, I had a little radio show, this, that, and the other. I had a sister in LA, and I was always headed here, but I didn't know what I was gonna do. My incentive, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna just look into my love life. <laughs> so, when I was in Kentucky, I used to get Jet Magazine and just, you know, dream about the Hollywood stuff and look at the, centerfold in the middle. I'll take you on a centerfold page. Of course. <laughs> Where we all. <laughs> and one of the things that often used to strike me is Greg Morris. Remember Greg Morris from Mission Impossible? Absolutely. So his family structure and my family structure was exactly the same. Two girls, one boy, well-known father and a mother. It turns out when I worked for KNX News Radio, which is where I started, mm. upstairs KNX Radio they used to, as you know, promotion people used to leave albums. I'm a music lover. I was like, oh, I can get free music. And the receptionist was fine. 
Nice. nice. But Kermit oh, Stephanus was Greg Morris's daughter. So we met, and I ended up, we ended up living together for four or five years. And, and so this, it's almost like a projection. I, I used to think about them in Jet Magazine, and now I'm, so anyways, that was my introduction to music. So I started out as a promotion person. I just worked my way in, did all that kind of stuff. And I tell people all the time, I was the poster child for the worst promotion person in the history of promotion. But I was so attracted to the job. Fast forward, I really like dealing with So who with was that? Where was where was I No, who was that promotion person? Don't don't me. Don't. Me. And I was terrible. Oh you, you were you were the worst promotion person. I was person. the worst promotion person. But then do a different takeoff for me. Tell me how you went from that process mm -hmm. and, and where was the real takeoff for her trade with? Where when did you become the, 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 the Superman? Oh, uh, God, that, that I know, because I don't know the guy you were talking about. <laughs> well, so here, here's, here's what's interesting about that, speaking of Juneteenth and black things. So when I got a job, which was first at RCA with Legia, and I was just sitting outside packaging 12-inch records, getting into clubs and going down into the hood and spreading stuff around, and I was the most bourgeois Negro in the hood going, hey, how you doing, Herb Charles from Solar Records? And they'd say, man, who is this nigga? Get this nigga out of here. <laughs> So I, I had to learn that, and fortunately I had Ray Harris and yourself and other people to sort of model myself afterwards, but I ended up to, a, to my good, good, good dear friend Virgil Roberts yes. at Solar Records, and what Solar Records were, they'll never get the story right because they don't ask the right people, but here's the bottom line. Solar Records was an entrepreneurial farm, and if you're an entrepreneur, so L.A. Reid was there, I was there, David Lombard was there, Virgil Roberts was there, Regina Jones was there, Sandy Wardlaw, Carolyn Ali, on and on and on, Doug McHenry, George Jackson, yeah. Dick Griffey. That notion was, how do you build your business? So now, Solar, Solar Records was a record company, for people who don't know, that was a black-owned record company right. um, that was staffed with quality black executives and why don't you tell people what the roster was on your label so people can get a better sense for those who don't know because we have a lot of people who are not oh, for sure. but so are. we're old so we always have to get all right it's all right oh yeah no it's fine listen i'm still cute too so. <laughs> uh so solar stood for sound of los angeles records yeah, it was really kind of a pop black music machine, and it had people like Whispers, Shalimar, Dynasty, um, Howard Hewitt, Howard Hewitt, um, Climax, um, and it also was a producer house. So L.A. Reid and Babyface started there. Jimmy and Terry started there early, but then went on. Uh, Dick Griffey advised Dr. Dre and Snoop to not take their records to somebody else and to become entrepreneurs. So through that house all the time was people on their way to success, people who were independent, people who were entrepreneurial. We managed Jesse Jackson's first presidential campaign. We, we were challenged to do things all kind of, when we took the Jacksons out on tour, it was with Robert Kraft, who owns New England Patriots. When I bought hot tickets to sell to people because we were connected, you know who sold me those tickets? Who was who was Joe Jackson's bag man? Who was it? Al Sharpton. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> so as a young guy coming up. Reverend, you mean Reverend Al Sharpton. Oh, he's, he's reinvented himself and, I, and much props to him. So that's also something we should allow ourselves as black people. So I came up in a system that fomented being an individual thinker, do your thing, take risk, and all that kind of stuff. So after Solar, I started managing Brian McKnight, and we connected because we liked each other's musical taste. Brian blew up. Um, I never take credit for doing it alone. We have great teams at X Time and other people that, but I had a pretty big influence on it. And our my management company was really known for bringing the stories We'll come to the label and tell you what to do. We'll work with you, but we're not going to just sort of be responsible. We're going to come with a marketing plan. Sharon Hayward ran everything. Damian Smith, who's now a Irving Azos partner, is my mentee. And so we came fully loaded, and we also tried to also be really collaborative, be good partners. So I got lots of stuff. I got my own 
label deals. I got finance to do things. People were, I was offered the presidency of RCA's Black Music Division. I turned that down. And, and the stuff was going, right? I also felt that I never needed to be in front of the scenes that much, but I wanted a lot of leverage behind the scenes. So a lot of my peers were running around, you know, flossing and being in the thing. I wanted to be quiet. So all the hallmark of my career is I've always given other people lots of credit. I care more about power and leverage than notoriety. So right? how, did you, how did you blow up people like Brian McKnight? Because Brian was doing a, 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 a kind of a pop R&B thing that just went through the roof. Was, was that just musical or was that special things you did to, to bring Brian into a mainstream artery? He was, the, he was the replacement for a lot of artists mm -hmm. of the past. Uh, the Ubo, the people of Bryson's and all those people. He replaced a lot of those people by being. Here's what we did. First of all, you never do it by yourself. So we had great teams. At x in the beginning, went on to other people, Motown, other places. Secondly, and even though we, we didn't get along and, and don't actually talk that much, Brian was a hard worker and an absolute brilliant musician. Played nine instruments, didn't have to read a note could sing the phone book. And ultimately what I decided to do was take the R&B aspects of Brian and keep them classic, but infuse the marketing campaign with some hip hop elements. Mm -hmm. so, and so what rappers would tell me is, yo man, I bang all day to, you know, to, to Biggie, but at night when I'm with my lady, Brian McKnight is on. Mm -hmm. And Brian McKnight always had style. We made sure that that's his own style, but we did that. Brian McKnight was an athlete. We promoted that. So you'd see him with Michael Jordan. You'd see him with other kinds of stuff. And ultimately, it was a niche other people couldn't fill. And so when you take those elements and bring them together and stay true to it, because he's writing classic. And I remember being at the Playboy Mansion. We had just had a song called Back at One. And the, the video treatment that we picked was an airplane crash. And Dr. Dre came up to me and said, yo, man, that airplane crash was the... And so ultimately, when you're willing to try shit, because at most of the stuff I tried, I was told not to try. Man, don't do that, man. That's not what we do. No, I don't do what we do. I'm going to try to figure out what works for something else, because why are you here? So Brian was the first step. And then ultimately, I had label deals. I had a label deal at, at Inisco. I had a label deal at RCA. I was an advisor to, literally at the time, Leor Cohen, paid me 50 grand a quarter to advise them on what to do with Montel Jordan because of Brian McKnight's success. How did you cross Brian McKnight over it so successfully? You, the you, team. Took him, you took him from urban radio into pop radio as well. There's a funny man you just reminded. So let me tell you a hero story. We come back off the first record and the first record made noise, did okay, but there was a big difference between a big, big time slot between the first single and the second single because we have the second single tied to Beverly Hills 9021. There was a year in between. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to come back with the next record. And we expect to go from, you know, five, six hundred thousand units to, you know, he's going to go platinum plus. We put out the first record, Mercury's loped up, we're at it stiffs, cold. <laughs> the company wanted a, a different record than any time. And I got to give these people credit. I had a very secret meeting with uh, Wayman Jones and Barbara Seltzer. And she was the pop promotion person, Wayman was the other one. And I was like, look, let's go with Anytime. Let's not tell the label. Let's do it over the Christmas holidays. We went to Christmas at, and had sold 11,000 albums. When we came back from Christmas break, we were at 97,000 albums. And the shit blew off. Not bad. But what ended up happening is, first of all, Brian made the records, Wayman and Barbara did the work, but I got a lot of credit for masterminding the turnaround, right? And I'm not sure it was all deserved. But once that happened and Brian went pop, he became a staple of pop radio with certain records. With other records, he was an R&B guy, which, by the way, was the same thing happened when I got with Maurice. So Brian had a run. We had 11 years. We sold 20 million records around the world. We toured. We sold out masses. But like, you know, I just treated him as a muscled up bad star. And 
we had kind of an intertwined thing. But but the, but the fact of the matter is, my team was phenomenal. Sharon Hayward and Daniel Smith were phenomenal, and I like running phenomenal teams. And yes, they, and I give them a lot of latitude, and they and they threw down. We also were not gentle. You know, <laughs> what do you mean when you say not gentle? Well, we didn't really suffer fools. Like, if you came with idiot shit, then I was going to call it out and say, and it's not like I was trying to flex. I was like, no, no, no. You're not thinking about this properly. You're thinking about this traditionally. And you got to think outside the box. Let us go try things outside the box. So Brian was one step. Then the segue to Maurice was the second step. And that, with the success with Maurice, publishing deals, taking stuff to Broadway, other kinds of things, did a record at Concord. I think a reputation starts growing around your career. And the through line through my career has been seminal black moments with black artists of greatness where a black person who was managing or leading the charge made sure white folks he was dealing with respected us at the same level they respected us. I didn't take any quarters. I didn't, you are going to play me the same way you play somebody else. Or we're going to have an intellectual discussion about it. I'm not saying I was the smartest guy, but you're going to meet me at that level and not make me the black artist or the black manager or my artist. So I'm going to ask you something. As you talk, Earth, Wind & Fire just represents too much grandeur. You got an Earth, Wind & Fire's mix after Columba. That's the way of the world. How did you feel that you could take them to another level? And what were those levels that you took Earth, Wind & Fire to? Because they, it seemed like they had already accomplished everything. They had, they had, and well, so here, here's, here's the answer to that question, it's a great question. At the time I got involved, I got involved with Maurice White. Maurice White had had Parkinson's and had stopped touring, and ultimately still had a catalog, a business, other things to do, but nobody around him was coming up with ideas for what he needed to do. The business structure was Maurice and White's name to Philip and the rest of the band so they could continue to tour, he could continue to make money. So I worked on Maurice White's side of what was going on. And it was interesting because some of that was contentious. Mm -hmm. Every every negotiation for the new license was contentious. And, and so I found myself sometimes pitted against people who I completely respected, but I do my job. I was on the side of the man. And then my mentee, Damian Smith, went and ran the Earth, Wind & Fire side so it was a it was a strange kind of but it was fascinating because with maurice i had certain latitude if it was about using the name maurice had the name if it was about using the catalog you could go do that so i had to go do non-traditional things like we did a record with concord where we had a bunch of famous artists do earth and fire stuff we took his catalog to broadway transamerica put up 18 million dollars i didn't know anything about broadway but i learned it. it was one of the most amazing things maurice and i were on the road but more importantly maurice white and Muhammad Ali got Parkinson's the same year. They had it the same exact number of years, and they died in the same year. And that's over 30 some odd Parkinson's. Amazing. And what I got entrusted with with Maurice was he always hid himself. He wasn't a really outgoing guy. And I was like, Reese, you got to understand that you give Parkinson's, the people with Parkinson's hope. You're functional, you're putting on plays, you're traveling. But what he also had to do was give up some of his dignity and put himself in your hands because Parkinson's is triggered by cortisol in your brain and it freezes you. Mm -hmm. And so anytime he did something public, if somebody came up for an autograph or I've been in restaurants where he would freeze and couldn't eat anymore, I have to wipe his mouth. And I knew that him putting himself in my hands was to say, protect me. Mm -hmm. Right. And, yeah. and, there were, and I mean, we stayed at the Watergate Hotel for three months previewing a play. I was with him every single day, and he was working every day. And I was like, Reese, people, and, and you know, we're meeting with Judith Jameson and Mikhail Barishnikov and yes. just amazing yeah. stuff. So the Maurice thing was amazing, and at the Maurice office is when Pensada's Place was born. Well, I, I want to talk about Pensada's Place, but I, but I also want to talk about BLM. Mm -hmm. this, this is a Juneteenth day. Yeah, uh, and, and 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 hopefully we'll come back to Pensada because that's a big part of you as well. Yeah, um, with so much emphasis finally being put on Black Lives and Black Lives Matter and the racial inequality, the Black Wall Street, mm -hmm. and you've been in in, in inch for a long time. Mm -hmm. You worked at Solar, a black 
own record company. Absolutely. Uh, with voluminous numbers of great artists, executives, the works. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on where the music industry is today? And I ask that for a reason. Lots of companies are kind of putting money out there for, for, for the Black Lives Matter. Universal Music Group, the largest of all the companies, put 25 million. While Sony and Warner's, if I'm not mistaken, both gave 100 million. Mm -hmm. It's baffling to me, but I don't want to talk about what I think. Right. What's your perspective on where record companies, mm -hmm. where, what's your perspective on where the music industry is and how they're dealing with the racial inequality? It's, it's a complicated path. I'll try to simplify it. There's a couple of things. We oftentimes negate the power of what we are as a group of executives dealing with a culture of music that literally is the driving engine to most of those companies. I don't believe that I need to block somebody out. So when you look at visions and hip hop, so on and so forth, that are led by white folks, it's because they care about it, they got into it, and, and there it is. But if you gave away that land piece, or you need to share that land piece, you have to also extract the equity out of those things and too often it's easy to buy us off here's a deal here's a car here's an advance here's a this here's a that be happy and go over there so it's always hard to get retrograde that's meant to fix a wrong from before and it's also very political so someone puts up a hundred million dollars it's great that you got to do it but if you're not part of the steering committee where that's going and you have accountability and you know what you want to attack then what you have, and I'm not faulting the companies, is you can have big, big cosmetic things. They put up 100 million, they put up 25 million, but what's happening? And the reason I'm saying that is in the audio space, which I've gotten into, which I never was a part of, never knew anything about. We just put together a group called Unity Game. And we did Game and Game, which is an audio yeah. thing that says things have to be balanced. And I put it together because in a $21 billion industry, which is just the audio sector, not the record sector, I found six black people who could green light things. And I probably am the biggest guy in it. And so everybody now wants to talk to us, chairman of Grammys, chairman of NAM, chairman of this, that, and the other, because they recognize this as a problem. You sell to our customer base, but you don't have anybody for pathways to management, nobody on boards, nobody coding, nobody doing the talent. But it's all the music that you, and they are more than willing to recognize it. Now, what I took from that is I looked at the other examples when everybody got going, and let's save all the record executives, and let's save all the black stuff. Well, a lot of what happened with that is politics sunk in. Internal politics have sunk some of those issues because when you bring that many people in, and you got that many diversion opinions, and you got big money on the line, and people want to lead it. All, all the shit that you know we grew up on, all the politics, all the sniping, can just grind it down to a halt. And I, I put my group together and said, we will not allow that to happen. And we've not had a bit of that because we learned from other things. And if you extend that metaphor farther, you saw that issue with Black Lives Matter. You saw that issue with defund the police. The politics, the messaging, and how you manage that it's not enough just to get the commitment. You got to manage the commitment. You got to show things that have happened. You got to hold people accountable. You got to know where you want to go. And sometimes you can't take on too big of a thing. Sometimes you have to do things in bite-sized steps. So for me, sometimes I call it guilt money. Everybody got guilty. George Floyd, that fucking tragic and <laughs> thing happened. And then all of a sudden, people are going to make up for what they haven't done by giving you a check. Well, that ain't really, that's, that's unsophisticated. Put up some money and let's put a plan together and then in a year report those results to everybody and let's see real change. And I don't like cosmetic change. Are we going to call it urban? Are we going to call it, that ain't what the fuck. Hire some people, make sure they have equity in something and call them a blue cup. I don't care what you call them. I care what you do to make change happen. And, and here's the other thing. Are they reckoning? with racial inequalities. No, I think that they're making sure that they are paying attention to it. I think there's well-intentioned people, but they have to understand they got to invest in making the change permanent and having it go someplace as opposed to just saying I put. And again, I think people are well-intentioned, but they're taking on a big, big, big thing. The other thing is that there's calendars. 
when it's hot, everybody's ready. And then, as you know, trends slow down, and all of a sudden, other shit comes up, and and so your ball can get taken off. The eye can get taken off the ball. So it's a big, complicated issue. The record companies, in my view, I mean, record companies are spending a million dollars a day on A&R. A million dollars a day. On A&R. On A&R. A lot of it is hip-hop. So hip-hop as a culture is incredible. It's incredibly powerful, and it can be incredibly destructive if it's not controlled. But what you can't do anymore is say that the economic relationship that we have, I've proven how fun... You're now spending a million dollars a day because this culture works. White folks buy it, Spanish folks make it, they all they all make it, they all love it. So where's my seat at the table so that we're making bigger decisions? Don't give me a little package of money over here. And a hundred million dollars is not little, but when you're spending a million dollars a day, a hundred million is something, and then who's running that package? Where is that goal? Where do we go? So you're taking a complicated problem, throw money at it, and it needs complicated and extensive follow-through and it's not always should be people in the record business are doing it they're not trained for that go hire the McKinsey company go hire somebody and, and consult us to make sure it's something that corporate has to deal with that's going to be instituted personally approach it as a business person and not necessarily emotionally and again I'm not taking anything away from anybody it's just super complicated last part is there's too much this didn't happen in our time there's too much of a, of, of a separation between the young and the hot and the active and some of the senior folks who could give them advice to help make the journey better. So, so I have a question. Yeah. You talked about the record companies and a million dollars a day on A&R. Mm-hmm. Hip hop is definitely the dominant music force. Do, do the record companies have a problem finding quote unquote qualified African-Americans to be the decision makers? I don't think so. Are they looking for people? I or think are they're already they, in place. I, I so it's a great question. I think some are in place. I think what they look for today, as you know, this it's a youth dominated business. So you're always always has been. Always has been, always has been right? Yeah. But there's times where they're not youth issues. But it's not, it's not it's not youth dominated if you're Clive Davis. So let's keep it let's keep it real. Well, no, well but, 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 but carry on. I don't want to change well, the conversation. Well, let, let, let's say what you said a different way. The record business has always said, let me identify five to seven people that are ageless. Clive is ageless. Doug Morris is ageless. L.A. Reid is ageless. There's certain people who make the cut, and there are other people who don't make the cut. Where's that x time? Where are you? Where's this? Where's that? And so ultimately, when you need senior thought, people who have been through things, through life experiences and so forth, you might not have it there. Now, that takes nothing away from Jeff Harlston or from Hunt or some badass talent, right? But when you put all that on them and they're expected to perform and so on and so forth, and here's the other thing. Now folks can make real money. So, you know, when you can be inside, be head of a division, have your own publishing company where you're signing producers, where you got your own marketing companies and you got all that kind of stuff going on, your you know your commitment to building you know racial equity it may be there, but you're also building your your financial equity. Mm-hmm. And so, in some ways, the sophistication of where we've come and the power we leverage can take away from the overall goal. I want you to tell us how did you how how did you come up with Dave Pinsada's or Pinsada's place? And for people who don't know, can you give us maybe a uh, yep. An elevated overview of what Pinsada's Place is. So Pinsada's Place is essentially a talk show oh, that covers the space of audio. Mm-hmm. We've been on for over 520 episodes. We're seen in 200 countries, probably about 8 million people a year. We are the largest influencer in that space in in the globe. When we first did it, nobody had done it. In the world, yeah. Yeah, in, anywhere. Now we have a lot of competitors, but we're still the biggest guys. And we weekly, Dave and I have shot this show. I Literally where I'm sitting is where I shot it, which is why you see Dave. That's Dave and Saul. Mm-hmm. Dave had a medical incident. And I used to manage him a long time ago when I entered, I got Dave in to do Bell Biv DeVoe, thought it was me. That was his first record that blew up. Mm-hmm. I did that actually with Kevin Fleming. Yeah. And Dave had a huge career as a mixer, and we'd always been friends. 
I wasn't managing him at the time. I was with Maurice. He had a medical incident. And somebody told me, and I, he said, what should I do? And I said, here's an idea. But it wasn't to do a talk show. It was to do something on the web. But he's not a worker like that. Anyways, through the suggestion of a distribution thing, they were like, oh, we, we would come up with that. So all of a sudden, I had to come up with a show. That's not what I do. Came up with a show, trying to tell him how to do it. It's not something I did. He was terrible. We had to do a pilot, and I said, I'm going to find you a co-host. I'm, I'm working with Maurice White, but I'll do this first pilot with you. We did the pilot, and the distribution platform came back and said, hey, we can tell you guys practice. we got good and bad news. The good news is that you practice. The bad news is we won't do it unless you do it with him. And I was like, oh, man, I don't want to fuck with that. What the fuck? <laughs> changed my life. Changed, yeah. changed my life. I've spoken at Google. We have spoken around the world. We have people, we have, we have the largest sponsors in the business. I have an enormous, an extraordinary amount of power in a place that people didn't look at. I'm seen as a trailblazer. As a, I, well, actually, in January, we got, we got inducted into the Hall of Fame with Joni Mitchell. Congratulations. Yeah, no, it's, it was a That's big deal. I mean, it's Joni Mitchell, Quincy, like there's the people that are in the Tech Hall of Fame are just the best of the best. We have a live touring division that goes around and speaks. We've had people show up from, you know, if we have an event, we did one in Washington called Cap Jam. We had people come from 19 countries in 22 states. That's we, cool. gave, we gave away five recording studios, 10 scholarships. I can call a manufacturer and they'll say, hey, what do you need? I'll send it to you. And it's been amazing because I was unknown in the business and there aren't very many black people. So I was Dave's friend. And for many years, they thought it was the Dave Pensado show, and it's not. Yeah. It's really Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and everybody. <laughs> so when we, like, I never went to NAM, And for the last seven years, I've gone to NAM, And we have to have security to walk around. Okay, and now, we're going to run out of time. you okay. got to tell people what NAM is. Because I've got a couple other questions for you, and I want you, you may have a question for me. But okay. tell people what NAM is. National Association of Music Merchandisers, which is the largest musical convention in the history of music. For four days in Anaheim, 160,000 people come. Is it in Anaheim all the time? It, it's in Anaheim all the time because people come from all over the world. All over the world. So I actually co-hosted their last virtual one with the chairman of NAM. And who, and, who, and who are the companies that are there? I'm sorry. Well, the, the, the people that are there are more important. So it's all oh, the people yeah. that make music and all the artists. So Stevie's in one corner, Herbie Hancock's in another corner, U2's in another corner, and it's Fender Guitar and Roland and this, that, and the other. The last thing that's also happened out in Salas Place, I am now on the board of educational schools. 1500 Sound Academy in Inglewood, I've been their advisor for a long time. Blackbird Studios in Nashville, which is amazing. Uh, Abbey Road, which is a legendary thing. They, they've asked me to be on the board. So I went into a space where most people wouldn't go. And I was like, oh, you let me in? Okay. <laughs> Let, let's go do this. So that's what Pensado's Place is, and it, it's been an amazing thing in my career. And now we're bringing lots of people through. It, and all the black talent is there. So every week I'll have Kendrick Lamar's mixer on, or Keith Urban on, or somebody from Mixed by Ali, or 50 yeah. James Fauntleroy. Yeah. All the people who make the music and produce the music and are stars of the music in every genre. We'll have Bad Bunnies people on. We'll have and they love us, and I'm like, I'm a 65 year old man, and y'all care. So, so you're, you're you're a bad boy. So, um, so, so, no, no, no. so on takeoff, I need you to tell me something. Okay. What would you like our global audience to know about you and your story? Um, Mark Cuban says the only thing you can control is your effort. 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 It's either excuses or results. It's not both. And so if you if you control your effort, I can tell you that I started Pensado's Place. I started it. I was 55 years old. I didn't know enter or net. Okay. <laughs> but I'm smart enough to say, let me get help. Let me learn. Let me figure out. I wasn't a broadcaster. I now do that continuously all kinds of places. And so don't think it's over. Put your innovation and your mind to it. Put your effort to it. And then learn what it is. I tell kids all the time, you can sit all day, try to play your pay your rent with likes and subscribes. Your landlord doesn't take likes and subscribes. You can stay there all day long. <laughs> I have a big platform. 
I have a lot of followers. I don't even look at the, I don't keep an Instagram thing. What I do is make sure somebody like Sweetwater or some of these big companies will pay us a hundred grand to do the work. Yeah. So, yeah. so you have to define where you're going to go and then go there and be the best you can be. What, what my good friend Virgil and I talk about all the time is never equal, either lesser, make the choice to be greater every fucking time. Set your own bar. So, so now, thank you. Now, and lastly, this is a segment that, that I do that's called Ask Ernie. Okay. That's where my guests get to ask me a question. Okay. If you got one. You don't have I to have one. I'll come up with one. <laughs> I'm never mad when you don't have one. No, no, no. But, I think, um, yes. So, if you take your perspective, you know, you've seen it all, you've run it all, you've been, and you know the ups and downs. What advice do you give people about the down periods? It's easy to be up. What advice I give people when it's down? When when their careers, their situations, whatever, right. are down. It throws a lot of people. It's 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 just the advice that I give everybody all the time. It's like it's like the advice of life. There are peaks and there are valleys. Yeah. You, as, as long as you're on flatline, it's it's really not that bad. Stay on the board. Most of us, when we're in the valleys, mm -hmm. we tend to. Sometimes feel like, you know, something's going wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, in my mind, I try to encourage people. Now, what I'm about to say to you is easier to say to you, but mm -hmm. it's not easy to do. Right. I try to encourage people to do inventory on themselves. Always. Take a look within. Always. Sometimes, sometimes the valleys are deeper than they need to be because of something we've done or we, or we get complacent in the valleys yep. and get stuck there because we read it as a flat line when it's really not that. There are peaks and valleys all the time. Well, so, I, I'll, I'll add to so I tell that to people. Though. And, and I'll add to that by saying I tell people all the time, when you're failing, you're learning. And when, you, when you're learning, you won't go back and make that mistake. Now, it's very hard to, in the middle of it to know that this is a good situation when somebody's after your car, you ain't got no money or whatever. But you will not make that mistake again. So every time you come out of that flat thing, you're better and you're more prepared for the next step. I have failed a lot. I don't know anybody successful who hasn't failed a lot. Because if you haven't failed, you haven't learned anything. So, you, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's important for not only people to hear, but people who have moved on in their career sometimes and have feel forgotten and left out, pivot. This is an opportunity for you to pivot. Yeah. Pivot well, and do something else. You, you, you can do it. If my old ass can do it, your, your ass can do it. Well, you know, you call yourself old, man, but we got friends that are older than both of us. Oh, absolutely. That are just so iconic. Herb, I, I want to say thank you, man, because this has really been incredible. But we got to do this again because you, right. you, got, you got too much. You, there's too much depth in where you've been and what you have to share. I, again, I want to say thank you. Uh, for joining me, and and, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll have to do this again. And our, our producer is getting us to go, but let me just say this. Ernie Singleton's contributions to our business and what we're done, one, his skill set is ridiculous, but even better, his heart is really what makes Ernie Singleton Ernie Singleton. So, brother, I salute you. I salute your contribution. You don't know how much I took from you, but I, I probably owe you publishing, but we'll talk about <laughs> uh, That's all right. I'm a big fan, brother. But you know, the, the publishing checks come by the mailman, so I know mailman money when I see it. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna cool. say musically yours, my brother. <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you the, the fist bump <laughs> pleasure, pleasure. virtually pleasure. and say thank you, man. I, I, I appreciate you, I love you, Er. And you. Uh, musically yours, I'm out. I'm here for you anytime.